Good evening and welcome to the December 18, 2018 Miller School Committee meeting. Um, before we begin, I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded and can be viewed on Mondays at 7 p.m. on Comcast Channel 8 or Verizon Channel, Channel 37. All meeting videos are also posted to the Millis Public Schools website under School Committee and all times on the agenda are approximate. My name is Stephen Catalano. I'm the chairperson. Um, the secretary, Kerry Roach, is unable to attend tonight. Robin Briggs. Here. Mark Conroy. Here. Denise Gibbons. Here. Uh, teacher Rep Bernadette Lindgren. Here. And then the student rep, Dory Stefano. Here. Here. And then um, the superintendent, Nancy Gustafson. Here. Okay. So, uh, Jody, has anyone signed in for open session? There is no. Okay. Um, so we have some action items. Um, first things first is the consideration to approve the 2004, two, two, I'm sorry, the December 4th, 2018 school committee meeting minutes. Mr. Mr. Conroy? Make a motion that we approve the December 4th school committee meeting minutes to have a second. Second. A motion's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, the next is the consideration to approve changes to the 2019 mm -hmm. 2020 calendar. Ms. Gustafson. One of our uh, wonderful school committee members alerted us to the fact that. Not this year's, but the 2019-20 calendar had an error. And um, in terms of where we placed April vacation, we had tied it to Good Friday, but it's actually supposed to be tied to Patriot's Day. So it is the third week in April. Um, actually, the fourth week, there's a partial first week. So it's really the fourth week in April from April 20th through the 24th will be April vacation. So the calendar has not changed other than just the dates are now correct. It's always been tied to Patriot's Day. I mean, um, Patriot's Day, and it's tied correct. to Patriot's Day again. So correct. We're, just, we're just updating um, a, a calendar issue. Yeah. Um, do I have a motion? Mr. Chair. Ms. Briggs. I move that we approve the changes to the vacation in April for the 2019-20 calendar year. Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Um, the next is the consideration to approve the purchase <coughs> of phones for the, do we want to put that on hold? Do you want to do that? We can put it on hold. I, I can, I just came from the ESBC meeting and they did. If you did want to do it, it now, we can do it. They did approve it. Um, if you have any questions, um, Mr. Wigan will be able to, although Miss Starr is here, she she might be able to answer any questions, but the ESBC did approve the contract for the phones. We are just awaiting um, town council's final review of the contract and um, to so that it conforms to all of the state legal language for the contracts. Um, but the pricing is is good. We're happy with the proposal. We're happy with the upgrade of, of the services that we get from this type of phone. And um, so we recommend um, authorizing either Mr. Wigan or myself to uh, sign that contract once town council uh, is happy with it, which should be tomorrow or the next day, should be this week. And here he is. So as a reminder, um, <clears throat> we've had a couple discussions on this. Um, there was a, a purchase of the new, new phone system for the new school, and then our system, we got approval at town meeting to upgrade our system, an intercom and phone system that will allow better communication in emergencies, more effective communication, easier use of systems. So um, we are combining um, the the elementary school building committee is contracting for their system, we're contracting for us, but we are going in together um, as town entities. Uh, the provider is TPX Communications. They're already working in town. They work for the, um, the police, and they did the work in the police and fire stations. Um, and so they are also, um, they're gonna be doing work in the Veterans Memorial Building as well. Um, and really the, there's, we, we, the, the business manager mapped out some, the, some cost to us and the variance. Um, and so the first couple years, the, 
the, the delta between what we have what we've have and what we've projected um, is small. It's less than 5,000 the first year, just over five in year two, and then year three, once again, less than 5,000. Um, in the renewal years, that could go up, um, but we're not at that point just yet. Um, so, but where the, the cost to us beyond the warrant, um, the operating cost is um, fair to say minimal. Um, there is there is an increased cost, but it's a small a small number, and the benefit far outweighs trying to maintain and keep the current system uh, that we have. So, um, I have a motion um, where this is a contract. Um, it's somewhat of a um, a formal motion. Mr. Conway, could I close on you? Do you have it? Yeah. Okay. yeah. <clears throat> and we'll authorize the uh, superintendent, the, the, the blank. Um, I move that the Miller School Committee authorize the superintendent to enter into a three year contract with TPX Communications for the installation and maintenance of a voice over internet protocol unified communication phone system with the annual recurring cost not to exceed $23,000. Annually, and for a first year installation cost at the Millis Middle High School, not to exceed $11,165. Said contract will not be signed until Millis Town Council has approved the contract for signature. Second. Motion been moved and second. Um, any discussion? Mr. Wigan, anything to add? No, I think the uh, inspection will have the contract language late tomorrow. Okay. Anything? Okay. Motion's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. We have a new system. Next on the uh, the agenda, uh, consideration to accept the donation of 20 walking desks uh, with an estimated value of $2,600. Um, Mr. Chair. Ms. Gustafson. This is um, Sharon Monaghan, one of our middle school teachers, had um, written a merit grant for um, t a set of 25 walking classroom units. Uh, so a walking classroom unit is one in which students listen to podcasts as they walk. And the research is that students actually learn more and you can see the research and the um, studies they've done on the website at thewalkingclassroom.org. Uh, Deb Hickey, one of our other teachers, piloted it last year and has presented at conferences on it. Uh, so Merit awarded uh, $725 uh, to pilot five of these units. And when Mrs. Monahan contacted the company, to explain that, she would be changing her order, order from 25 to 5 initially. They offered to donate the remaining 20 units with an estimated value of $2,600. They uh, do get a lot of corporate sponsorship, uh, which they explain on their website. But there are some conditions for the donation that Mrs. Monahan would need to uh, basically pilot them, allow um, pictures of her class using them, except for, of course, students whose parents have signed off that they do not wish to have their students' pictures um, taken or used in any publicity. And then um, students will write thank you letters, et cetera. They, they will also give feedback through some online surveys. We looked at um, Mrs. Knowlton and Mrs. Monahan looked at the requirements and felt that these were reasonable and easily accomplished and they are asking for you to approve the donation from the walking classroom of 20 additional sets. Walking and listening to podcasts is an excellent idea and I completely and utterly support that <laughs> and the fact that we're getting these donated is awesome. So I would take a motion. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I'd like Ms. To Gibbons, I'm sorry. I'd, um, I would like to submit a motion to approve the donation of 20 units um, of walking classroom materials with an estimated value of $2,600 from 
Where are they from? From the walking classroom dot org. Oh, thank you. From yeah. the walking classroom dot org. Yeah. Motion's been moved. May I get a second? Second. Motion been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 What a great. We need to get those meeting. for our meetings here. We, we did. We did the Google. <laughs> let's just let's let's slow down on the walking. We're gonna get there. Come on, just you like not. to walk? It's gonna be Steve? the walking like meeting. Walk? We're gonna walk and meet at the same time. I, like I was that. trying to go to their website, but it's not working. Right, we'll okay, moving on. Tracks. Moving on. We'll talk it. about that later. Um, the next uh, action awesome. item is the consideration to approve an out-of-state trip. In fact, out of state, Ooh. out of the country, to Ecuador in 2020. Thank you. Uh, we have Yvonne Fitzgerald and Mr. Mullaney here. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I am one of the Spanish teachers in the high school that is helping plan the Ecuador and Galapagos Islands trip for 2020. It will be during April vacation. Currently it's scheduled from April 16th to the 24th, but due to flight differences and when they can get tickets, that might shift a little bit from the 16th to the 7th and, and so forth. Um, we currently have 53 applicants for the trip. Um, this means that we would end up going in two separate groups, similar to what we're doing next year for Costa Rica. Um, it is a one to six chaperone to student ratio, and we're hoping that we have your approval to take these students on this wonderful trip. Well, I'm not technically taking them yet, but so that this can get approved. <laughs> The company that we're using, is it the company that we've used for other international trips? Yes, this company is the one we've been using for the past 13 years. So a, com years. a company that we know, a company that we've had success with, a company Correct. that we're comfortable with. So nothing has changed other than the location of Correct. the trip. Okay. And Mr. Chair, if yes. I may, and Mr. Mullaney and I met uh, last week with Mrs. Uh, Ms. Palladino. And not only do the teachers um, do a superb job chaperoning, but they, um, in the months prior to the trip, they run various activities, usually monthly, maybe a couple times a month, um, some uh, cultural things. So there, there's a very close tie-in with the educational component. They do a couple of bonding experiences so that um, these chaperones are really doing um, a lot of pre-work with the students ahead of time. And as, as Yvonne mentioned, the application process ensures that students are responsible, meet deadlines, have to explain their thinking. It is not just a little jaunt. Correct. It's we not a touristy we, jaunt. Yes. <laughs> um, we also try to acclimate them to the culture shock because when you go to South American, Latin American countries, it can be quite a shock for our students. So we really try to prepare them for third world situations because they're not used to seeing that. So. Yes, Mr. Conroy. So with a one to six ratio, so we eight chaperones. Correct. It, all students end up going. Yep. Usually, sometimes students change their mind or hardships happen, yep. so students end up dropping. But yes. And who chaperones all? teachers here or? Yes, Mo generally she tries to choose chaperones within the school so that the students are familiar with the teachers, even if they don't have them. Yep. Um, students are very familiar with the teacher. Also to be able to talk to administration if there's any medical situation, and the nurse as well, we work very closely with her so that we get to know the students if we don't have them in our classroom yep. for medical situations, any type of um, um, prescription use that they're gonna be taking abroad we have meetings with parents, we have meetings with the nurse. So she, Ms. Palladino, generally tries to stick to student uh, chaperones within the building. Any other, any other questions? Discussion? Okay, a motion's been moved and seconded. All in favor? No motion. Nobody we didn't make a motion yet. No motion. Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. No yes. one, no one, I, I made a mistake. Okay. I'll take a motion now. Mr. Chair. Ms. Gibbons. Uh, I make a motion to approve the trip to Ecuador and the Galapagos Islands on or around the dates of April 14th, 16th rather, to April 24th, 2020. Now, the motion's been moved and seconded now. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So approved. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you. And then, why don't we take the other? Yeah. Sure. I want to pick it up. Mr. Weiss. Mr. Weiss, would you like to come join us so that you can head on your oh, way Oh, actually, to you know what? Before we do that, can we oh, do Dory. the student and teacher reps? Yeah. Let's we'll, do the student because okay. we'll be right with you. Go ahead, Terry. Um, class dues will begin to rise after the winter break if students have not already paid them. Spring sports teams are beginning to meet for any players interested in joining. The senior class will continue to fundraise until winter break. Several clubs are fundraising for the holidays, including the Leo's Club, that are collecting money to donate gift cards to teens in need. And the high school band and chorus concert will be on Thursday, December 20th at 7 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lundgren. All schools will be starting on break this Saturday, the 22nd, and we will resume school on January 2nd. Um, this Friday at Clyde Brown is Pajama Day or Ugly Sweater, Ugly Holiday Sweater Contest Day. So, um, want to borrow it? <laughs> the middle school's drama club is going to be presenting an abridged adaptation of the Midsummer Night's Dream. They are going to begin auditions in January um, in the high school. They're looking for some students to help to be production assistants, and their rehearsals will be Wednesdays and Fridays from 2.30 to 4 p.m. for any students that are interested in the middle school. Uh, performance is expected to be in late April. The high school has um, the, they're on the lookout for more presenters from various careers because on March 6th we're having our third small school big future conference and the conference runs from 8 a.m. until 10.50 p.m. So we need presenters from all different career fields, anyone in the community who would like to volunteer, if you know someone outside of the community that has an interesting career that they, or other skills that they would like to share, like resume writing, there are different um, programs that go on during the day, not just presenting your career. So um, they are looking for presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, now, what, Mr. Weiss, are you ready? I'm sorry about that. So you're here to talk about uh, municipal vulnerability preparedness. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm Robert Weiss. I'm energy manager for the, for the town. Uh, and I am here with some uh, presentations from members of uh, this committee. Um, as you know, I'm sure, uh, the last three uh, years were the hottest years uh, on record. Keeping those records, in 2015, we had four weekends in a row with snow, giving us uh, about seven feet of snow, more than uh, an annual uh, amount of snow in just uh, 30 days. Earlier this year, we had uh, four nor'easters in the month of March alone. Uh, climate change has, uh, and, and the folks who have been working with climate change have been making these predictions uh, of more frequent weather events of uh, greater intensity, and this is just going to increase, as we know, um, in the coming years. And uh, this has uh, caused the Commonwealth to ask how are municipalities going to prepare uh, for the results of, the, uh, of these severe weather events. Um, so we're uh, on uh, January 8th at the library, at the public library, and we're going to have a one-time opportunity to get people together from all sectors of the town, um, the state and, uh, and the Metropolitan Area Planning Council have uh, graciously given us grants so that we can have this planning process, and we'll be getting together uh, initially to um, determine vulnerabilities and the strengths of the town uh, when faced with severe climate events. So this is going to, we're calling this the uh, Community Resilience Building uh, Workshop. We will get together, uh, it will be starting at 9.30 in the morning. It will go until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's going to take on the, the uh, format of, of, of a planning charrette. But by the end of the day, uh, we will have a plan um, which will allow us, give us a designation that will allow us to qualify grants 
so that we can uh, take actions that we determine in this meeting, take the actions to help us prepare uh, to prevent uh, damage from severe climbing events and also to prepare from, for the results uh, that should happen. Uh, so we're asking that you folks can show up or, or have a representative from the committee or several representatives from the committee <coughs> to come. Um, we're also, uh, it, while it is by invitation only, uh, we're asking that anyone who wants to attend, to participate and contribute to the, to the planning process uh, can call me and I can send them a, an invitation. I'm, a, uh, of course, at the town hall at 376-7040. Three, three and uh, I will uh, give you your, uh, your invitations here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything we would need if we do send a rep or reps? Do we? Is there anything we need to prepare? Or is it just do we come open, well, open mind? What do we need to I do would for you? Come with an open mind, but I also come. But I would also come with some ideas as to uh, you know, what think of what a severe a severe snowfall could do to the town. What wind can do to the town? So we know that in uh, was it in Houston today? It was they called off school because the. Uh, because of uh, a tree that fell on a, a power line to put out a uh, significant section of town. Heat waves, um, you know, who suffers from a heat wave? We think uh, we have a, a, a pretty large elderly population in town. So you gotta think of the, um, uh, and, and what happens if the grid goes out and uh, a lot of folks are without, elect without electricity, without cooling in a, on a hot afternoon. Uh, can we can we uh, get a grant for a cooling center and for a program that allows us to reach out and, and, and uh, help folks get to the cooling center? Uh, so there's so many things that, that uh, we can think about. And so if you have ideas and, and think, think of needs, think of the environment, think of uh, the economy of the town, think of uh, the infrastructure, think of uh, the, the various populations. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions? Good. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you folks very much. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. All right. Um, next up is time and learning. Technology update. Ms. Starr. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Wigan. Good evening. <laughs> Chromebooks that were purchased for Clyde Brown. Uh, in January, students in grades four through 12 will have one-to-one -one access to mobile devices, which is very significant. Um, in the year and a half that I've been here, that's a huge growth in devices. Um, we've been trying to deploy additional Apple TVs into classrooms. If you're not sure what those are, the little devices that allow you to mirror, I can airplay a laptop. Um, students can mirror the display on their iPads and such. Uh, we're piloting something new um, the iPad Pros are very big tablets, and they have an Apple Pencil that writes very just like a regular pencil. And in the math classes, one in middle school and one in high school, um, piloting the idea of untethering teachers and allowing them to, instead of having a document camera, for instance, photograph whatever it is they're working on and be able to work on that, um, hand it to a student, have them be able to work. So it's untethering them and trying out a new way to um, use that technology in the math classroom. 
one of the teachers um, in math was already doing this, and so we're trying to grow that program. But um, some bigger things, we've had uh, the Power School online registration was implemented this fall. It seems to have gotten a very good response. We've gotten good feedback, uh, very good participation. One of the most significant pieces of that, I think, is for the office staff. Uh, come November, they would still be entering paper uh, by hand from the paper, and they didn't have to do any entering of data. It was all reviewed by them and automatically entered, which is uh, huge for our data integrity, uh, huge for getting the data in and usable more quickly. So it's a big win. Uh, our health, uh, health office application, SNAP, is also integrated with PowerSchool now. So rather than having two separate processes where <clears throat> we have PowerSchool updated and then that information goes to the nurses and they're entering data into SNAP, now those two systems um, integrate with each other very well. Um, our learning management system, it's learning. We went through an integration with PowerSchool for that as well. Um, that's significant in that the principals and teachers spend so much time creating schedules and rosters in PowerSchool now with that integration, those courses are created right from the schedules in PowerSchool in our learning management system, and all those courses are populated with students. So rather than manually creating courses, adding students, um, that's done automatically. And then another piece of that is a new student coming in gets entered into PowerSchool, being given a schedule, and then with that um, update, they're automatically in their courses. So there's a lot of automation that happens. Another piece with our it's learning learning management system, we've got uh, implemented single sign-on and integration with Google Suite. So some of our teachers use Google Classroom. We have a very similar workflow now in its learning um, that we use with, with um, its learning in Google and Google Classroom. And single sign-on means that the Chromebooks that students log into uh, when they go to its learning, they're automatically logged into its learning. So it's, little by little getting that single sign on going so that we're uh, integrating our systems and having fewer passwords, fewer logins to keep track of, to update. And again, when somebody new comes in, all those different systems a student has to be added to that streamlines that whole process. Over the summer, we were able to upgrade um, approximately 40 teacher laptops with um, solid state hard drives and increasing their RAM. So rather than having to get a whole slew of new laptops on top of the ones we've had. We were able to uh, add a lot of longevity to the laptops that we have. So that was a very big project. We thank Dave for that. Um, <coughs> you may or may not have heard about Fuse MA. I'm not sure how much you've heard from that. Uh, it's a purposeful inter-district coaching model. It, it started in Rhode Island, and we're in the first cohort, among the first cohort in Massachusetts with the Fuse MA. Uh, our FUSE fellow here is Chris Nardone in fourth grade. He goes to other districts and coaches, and we have two FUSE fellows who come here and coach. And right now we've got teachers in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade participating in that. They're called Lighthouse Classrooms. And essentially, they, there was a design team com composed of people from our district we decided on some instructional practices, three of them that we wanted to focus on, and then under those instructional practices are strategies, and those are the strategies that are being coached under that program. So that's being implicated, impl oh, I should have put sixth grade in there too, implemented this year, and um, it's going well. Thank you to Merit, uh, a very large funding opportunity for us to, um, to purchase and implement some virtual reality labs that Hopefully, we'll be starting in January. We've been evaluating them. The technology changes weekly. Um, the opportunities for things change weekly. So we're, we're, we have to pick a point to stop seeing the changes and pick a point to jump in, and January seems to be it. That will open up uh, about 900 Google Expeditions opportunities. There's a Jane Goodall discovery kind of uh, activities, or safaris, and all kinds of things. So lots of opportunities there coming up. If you ever want, we can bring that here to demo. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, please. Yes, please do that. <laughs> <laughs> Another piece of that that I didn't add here, but apparently we have a 360 video camera in district. And we, I've been talking with a couple of teachers about planning our own virtual field trips and trying to see if we can bring 
our own 360 experiences and use the goggles for that. So we've got some, some other things planned. You guys should do the new school and open so that the people in town can see it. Oh. No one's watching. <laughs> <laughs> So, but yes, we were actually thinking that might be a really fun way to do a walkthrough, get a video of the school as it is now, and be able to kind of give some updates. So yeah. it's, it's a learning curve for all of us, but it would be really neat to be able to maybe bring in concerts or um, if we have a park display, be able to do 360 video, some of those things. Yeah. And have the students getting into that, and the right. teachers really right. have some great ideas. Um, and then this last one could be its own meeting. Um, so the Massachusetts Small Rural Schools Data Management Consortium, I put some paperwork in there for you. If it's something of interest, you can read through. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but um, it is very important. It's a huge piece of having uh, standardized data, which is integral to interoperability between systems. So this EdPi standard is something that um, we're striving for. Uh, Nancy and I had gone to this meeting to decide if Millis wanted to be part of this consortium and part of this effort. It mirrors something that we've done with the, um, the tech collaborative around student data privacy agreements. Working as a group, the vendors listen to a group of, of districts who want something to happen. This has been um, across the country already functioning. Massachusetts is just getting started and um, we've decided to become part of that consortium and and help drive what that data dashboard might look like and what kinds of data, what we want our data, what questions we want our data to answer. So okay. um, that's it's all funded by the Dell Foundation, so yes, free to us. <laughs> and that's actually very significant because the way these systems do or don't speak to each other, you essentially need to develop little bridges, what they call it, just to you know, not get technical, but bridges that allow one system to get data from another system and it's very expensive to develop those. They're, the APIs is expensive. And some of these companies are not huge, uh, and, or they don't necessarily want to spend the time developing. So having that funding piece there means that not only do they have funding, but engineers that can help build those bridges, those APIs. So it's a good consortium, I believe, to be part of. Okay. Um, you'll probably hear me say, and hear Terry say, New and evolving costs and needs. Uh, this has been a really reflective process, going through the questions that the committee had, going through uh, my budget questions, and kind of unpacking the way things have been done in the past, and looking at how things have changed even just in a year and a half, and looking forward to where we're going. So uh, as we're trying to do our strategic planning around budgeting for technology, and trying to answer those questions about what does it really cost? They're, the new and evolving costs and needs are kind of adding to the complexity of the answers to those questions. Um, there are both objective and subjective aspects that I'll get into when you're talking about how, to, how much does it cost to operate a technology program. And from a budgetary and policy perspective, we have to kind of uh, consider how do we define which items are technology budget items. And there's, there are many blurred lines because of technology is infused in everything we do, every aspect of what we do. So uh, defining and delineating where do these various technologies that come out of the budget. You can talk about centralizing a technology budget, and yet you still have digital textbooks, and you still have uh, security systems. So uh, it's complex. So <coughs> which leads to this. It's systemic, it's integral, it's uh, part of our everyday, but there are all different categories of where we're using technology. The teaching learning, huge uh, productivity, Chromebooks that we're trying to use here, uh, the Google. <laughs> uh, our operations, the, as we add phones and we add security systems and cameras, those require new cabling, modernizations to networks. There, it, the implications of everything that we do just grow and grow and grow. Um, security and facilities, some of these things are remotely, remotely operated now. In and control your climate of your school from anywhere. You know, there's an app for everything. And then the data and data management piece, uh, again, I alluded to our the consortium, but also how we're managing uh, students' data uh, safety, student privacy, and student data, and how much of that is now 
going more into the cloud or, or sharing systems. So there's a lot to think about in terms of that. Um, another example, just going backwards, the SNAP Health Services program has tended to be funded under the health budget, and yet it, the contract comes through the technology office, and we're working together to make two different systems talk. So it, it's very overlapping. So what is the total cost of operation for technology programs? Um, we've got salaries, we've got devices, we have many, many aspects of the network and the networks. We've got all of our district-wide systems and then some very specific department systems. An increase in some of the contracted and hosted services has changed you know, from more of a capital expenditure to something that's become more of an operating expenditure. Printing and copying, kind of shifting our thinking there. Uh, E-rate, we have category two E-rate funds that we can try to tap into, but E-rate's complicated, but uh, if we're at a 40 or 50% reimbursement rate, we would have to have all the funds available. Uh, if we were, say, have a $50,000 project and we had a 50% reimbursement rate, we'd have to have that 50,000 like budgeted and available, and then we'd be reimbursed so we would get it back, but it's, it gets complicated there. Uh, we have a number of grants around special education, uh, private grants, um, things like um, merit and other grants that we donations. Uh, the device replacement schedule is a very big piece of what we talk about. We've shifted what kinds of devices we're getting. We've shifted a little bit of how we're getting our devices and funding them. Uh, we've set a four-year life cycle that seems to be pretty um, effective. The iPads start to become obsolete, start to not be able to be updated on the apps anymore. We're finding that our, our iPad and device buyback programs got complicated when we started looking into the, the processes that we need to use. We had you know, funds that came into the district last year by selling back some iPads, but we're finding now that there's a process that we have to follow that's even more complicated, so those are things we have to think about. But the device replacement schedule has been incorporated into the capital improvement plan, which is projected out 10 years. Um, it's all based upon past purchases and current needs. It isn't really 10 years from now we will have things to look at that we didn't know we were going to have to look at and opportunities. So uh, that replacement plan, even being built into the capital improvement plan, definitely needs to be evolving, needs to be dynamic, responsive to uh, those new and evolving needs and costs. So should we be spending more? Yes. yes. <laughs> that's the only, that's the right answer, correct? Yeah, <laughs> hey, I figured you'd want some answers under that, so. That's yeah. true, <laughs> that is. I love that first bullet. <laughs> yes, we should be. It was going to be one bullet in the next slide, but I guess <laughs> should put a little more information. Right? Um, so we have um, increased our devices, we've increased uh, the, the complexity of the kinds of things that we're doing with technology in the district. Technology maintenance and support is a huge, I would call, critical need the moment. Um, the curriculum is getting more and more digitized. Uh, teachers are taking time to create content. Uh, that's you know, the, the kinds of content they're creating um, using iPads, using uh, it's learning and creating learning paths. There's, there's so much that's going on there, but there's a lot more we could do with, with already created digitized curriculum that is dynamic and amazing. Um, we're migrating some systems to hosted solutions or might have to start talking about that, especially in terms of um, certain things are just going that way. Our, our teacher grade books are going that way. They're going to be uh, browser based. It's just, they're not supporting this app kind of thing anymore. So that's a, a big piece of our discussion. We've started automating some systems and processes. There is an app for everything and there's the possibility to automate and have technology do some of these um, processes for us but again, that's at an expense, and it tends to be an operating expense. Um, modernization and state-of-the-art learning spaces and opportunities in the VR labs that Merit is funding is a start. This is a space here in the library that we want to uh, turn into a Merit Innovation Lab and keep building pieces, and Merit is, is supportive of the idea of accepting proposals for more components for that, but again, um, I know there are districts creating actual virtual reality Labs, like a room that has the real deal um, 
So, you know, what do we want to have for our students here? And I, just to think a little bit about um, the funding piece, sometimes it's just reallocating or rethinking how we're spending versus spending more. It's, it can be done. I love that line. That is a great line. Thank you. Because it's not, you're, you're absolutely right. It's not just, sometimes we're, we're going to identify because we're doing through major cost centers mm -hmm. that we need to spend more. Mm -hmm. And then in some of the cost centers, it's maybe not spending more, taking from here to do this. Maybe we needed the money here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you said at least three times, things have changed just in the year and a half that you've been here, Absolutely. right? And a year and a half out, mm -hmm. not because we've stopped doing something, but costs have gone down. We don't, we're not using that technology. Mm -hmm. And so it, the money's there. What do we do with that? that money, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. I mean, I've been in the education technology business almost 20 years, and the things that I didn't have in the beginning and could never have imagined that we would have at our disposal uh, now. So but part of this, <coughs> and I don't want to say exercise just kind of because it, 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 mm -hmm. it, it's, it is going to help our budgeting process, but part of the exercise was to identify, are there areas that we do, do need to spend more, right? Because, and I don't know if if you were told we were looking at current, mm -hmm. preferred, and then ideal, right? Mm -hmm. And so the current is what we have now, and that maybe that's the reallocation. The preferred is where do we, where would we like to go, and then what's the ideal? We may, we may never get to the ideal mm -hmm. um, based on dollars today, but in five years, right, maybe technology has changed, costs have gone down, maybe we could get to the ideal with the current mm -hmm. money. We just don't know, so this is not just making you to go through this whole process, but just to kind of rethink, because we need to know where we need, where we need to be reasonably need to be. Yeah. And, and some innovative thinking around, I'll, I'll give you some of the ideas that I have in there and talk about the preferred, and I didn't build it into this, but I knew your questions would be there for that. Um, but there are definitely ways to look at what is being used well, what is being used, and maybe shifting, um, shifting funds from one place to another. And, and or investing in one place that has repercussions that are, you know, the cost the, the cost is minimal compared to the benefit to the district. So, um, sorry, I cut, I cut you off. No, that's okay. Um, no, it, so regarding one to one in BYOD, I don't know how I yeah, I did switch. Um, so we have a lot of one to one in our district. The the access to devices has made a huge difference in how teachers teach and what they're able to do. Uh, that's had a huge impact, though, on the tech team, on uh, responsiveness. Everybody wants to be there for everybody to do everything they need, but 2.8 people uh, supporting about 7,800 devices and multiple networks in two buildings. If you do the math, the ratios are way off from what anybody in the industry would recommend as a reasonable expectation for uh, not all of those devices need to be fixed constantly. But they're managed through uh, the Google Management Console. They're managed through our mobile device management system. Um, we're constantly, you know, constant stream of, of students coming in for connectivity issues. You know, if this this app needs to be updated, pushing this one out. So it is a constant stream of that. And then we just we're always fixing it. So what? We, we joke that we can't see Dave when we walk in the office anymore. So two point eight. What do you think it should be? I would love to see at least four. Um, the current point eight, the way that position is going to be um, advertised, will hopefully be as a, a full, so we'll be up to three. But we absolutely need at least one more technician, and I, my ideal would be having um, some kind of help desk um, person that is the like a help desk manager. That so is that desk. above and beyond the four? That would be yeah. That would be so my ideal. Five. integrating so many systems, we are also managing tons of accounts. And most people don't think about this, but rostering all of those different disparate systems is so time consuming. Um, and if they're all separate and um, one person comes into school, all of a sudden the, the 12 emails flying, um, this one needs to be put in this system, this system, the password different here. So those kinds of things are things that people end up waiting for. 
or jumping in and trying to help. So everything has grown in complexity. Um, I think even two people would change our world dramatically in terms of the, the support for teachers and the support for their devices and, and moving. So forward. getting to 4.8? person that we had resigned so we're going to be advertising that position as a full-time position at the same the cost, cost. Same. okay so you so you're going to increase from 2.8 to 3 yeah. you're reallocating by bringing someone in at a lower yeah. same rate just you can get you can get a one out of that appointment yeah. okay yes. you don't so. need you don't think you need two help desk managers one for each school one for each building I would say no, I think one would work. Um, so part of what we're working on right now, and one of our seniors, it's her senior project. Um, we're developing a student help desk. And one of my ideas and her ideas as it's growing is to turn that into more than just a student help desk. Have it maybe be a path to credentialing or a path for dual enrollment. Um, have them be able to actually take on some skill tasks and be able to move between buildings. So we'd like that to actually be a track that some students could take. So that is one of those costs that we're talking about that's minimal to pay for certifications, and yet then we have a, a student who can intern or work with us and accomplish some of these tasks and graduate with some good experience. And you think you could find a student every year to we work have, in that role? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we have three right yeah. now. One, one graduated, but he came back for a break and is going to work for us um, to do some projects this winter. And two, we have a junior and a senior. And you think there's people coming up that you could if we... Yeah. And I think if it were a track or a course, uh, a work study, some kind of compensation, whether it's credits, whether it's um, community service or a, a stipend of some sort, we definitely would build it. And a, a big piece of that too is it's not just techie people that we need in that help desk. We need people who can troubleshoot an app or help somebody learn to use that app or help students with their uploading and their workflow and we've got plenty of students. In fact, the student who's helping plan the student help desk, I actually asked for a business-minded person, not a techie, to plan that so, um, so that we can really design the job description to not to just be techie people, but to support. Our, our, the support we do is tech, but it's also instructional. Sure. It's also networks. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of opportunity. And I think whatever pool we have, it will just compensate for what we it got its own slide. New and evolving costs and needs. So support and maintenance staffing, untethering teachers, and developing some flexible workspaces, uh, and collaborating between classrooms, between grades. We've got a lot of different kinds of collaboration that goes on in this district. We um, have some shifts in workflow and options for devices that surround the idea of possibly using like an iPad Pro and, and a tablet pencil in, in a workflow versus having the projector that goes to the document camera that goes to the computer that goes to the, you know, you're eliminating a, a piece of equipment there by having that workflow and having them untethered. We do have to talk about some new cabling and fiber at the middle high school around uh, the phone systems, around uh, modernizing enough to handle the kind of bandwidth that we need to have here. Certainly, um, anything that we can do to start building some state-of-the-art learning spaces and opportunities, if they're not here, maybe they're in the community, maybe they're connected to colleges, but how do we find those opportunities and connect with those? We should be counting on increases in contracted and hosted services, and I absolutely think we should be looking at some of the curriculum resources that are out there, like a discovery textbooks, things like that, that are dynamic, that have many tools built into them that are very um, effective because they have multimodal uh, you know, uh, delivery of the, of the content. There are amazing simulations out there, things like Labster, where you could be in a million dollar chemistry lab conducting an experiment. Um, these are things you subscribe to that they cost. So uh, I'm almost done. In the pipeline, we've got to start also talking about some policies around social media and social media archiving. We've had some discussions with the tech director meetings about that. There are companies that do that. 
and um, we're supposed to be archiving all of our communications, emails, and so that's something that's going to be coming. The data dashboard in the EdFi consortium, I gave you a little information about. Um, we, the, we work with SELT, and they have offered a free uh, evaluation around uh, um, cybersecurity and ransomware, so we're mm. working with Don, um, our network manager, to, to uh, facilitate that. And then you know about our new phones and communications. So I would end just with three questions just to, to ponder. Um, what do we want our classrooms to look like? We don't have to stay with the models that we have. Can think differently. Our teachers really do think differently. A um, million different kinds of chairs and desks and you know situations and the way students are arranged. But um, what do we want them to look like? What do we want to see our students doing? What is what do we want our education to look like here? And how does our technology funding support the student learning that we're accomplishing? Today? So maybe some looking at, does anyone have any questions about kind of the programmatic, the thought process? The, every, every time you come in here, it's informative. It's uh, been helpful. Um, and you definitely, and we've gotten reports when you're not here from the superintendent that you're being very strategic and you're working well with many different facets within the district to um, help automate things that were paper and pen or an Excel spreadsheet, so there's a piece of that. You're, help, you're working with the teachers, so all of that is fine. So some, a lot of what this was about was also the financial piece, mm -hmm. and I hope that it was helpful for the two of you to sit probably multiple times. Yes, Terry brings a wealth of knowledge, and he is, um, our thinking is similar in a lot of ways, and we both bring our different thoughts to each other, so we've been a good team as far as Excellent. discussing where we could go, what it could look like. So I'll throw out the first kind of, just the bigger question, and I'm either one. All of this being said about moving things around and bucketing, should we, when we, as we approach FY20, is, do we need to look to try to increase, and I know it's in different pockets, mm -hmm. do we need to put X amount of dollars more on the technology, in the technology bucket, okay? Understanding that there are different line items and it's across the district. What, and, and obviously we heard, yes, we need to be spending more. <laughs> but now let's get down to the, to the quantitative piece. What, what is that number and, uh, and, and then how do we get there, right? Because that's not necessarily on you. The conceptual answer, Terry can give you the number answer. The conceptual answer would be whatever we were willing to spend for personnel to increase that. That would be a piece for technology. The other piece would be looking at for instance, um, different departments, different schools might be purchasing their own devices going through us so that we're getting you know, the, the consistency in what we're purchasing, but technology is being purchased all around the district. So that was one of our questions around the policies and procedures. Do we, how do we centralize it yeah. or do we have separate technology budgets because technology is kind of being defined differently and being purchased in a lot of different ways. So depending on how we defined it and where we wanted it to come from, that would kind of dictate the numbers that we would be looking to increase. Yeah, and, and I guess I would, I would expand in the sense of talking about the actual numbers, I would say there's three buckets, two of which are in your operating budget. The first bucket we talked about, you, you really do have a need to look at personnel. And, and see about increasing the, the people who actually support the technology. Because the, the, the stuff is great, but if you don't have the people to support the stuff, the stuff is useless. The second, and we talked a little bit about it throughout Jim's presentation, and uh, I talked a little bit about it in, in my, my financial memo, is you've got an increasing number of, whether it's applications or software packages, um, have really grown dramatically just in the last four years. Um, and that's a number that's probably going to continue to increase. Um, Can I interject something yes. there too? A change that's happened that people don't think about. We used to buy the computer, install the software, run with it for four years, buy a new computer, and reinstall the software. Right. 
they don't sell the software anymore. They sell the subscriptions. So it's shifted a lot about how we the, function. The, the example, the, when we were talking, and the example that I, I use a lot of times with people is you used to buy a disk with Microsoft Office on it. Now typically you buy Office 365 and you pay a monthly subscription. And that's typically more and more what we're seeing with any kind of software, whether it's educational or it's productivity software or whatever. So those are things that we're going to have to come to grips with in our operating budget more and more uh, with the types of things we use in the schools. The third, which is a, a, a little different bucket, okay, and it is something that the town has typically been pretty consistent in supporting, but we may have to see if they'll support it to a little greater degree, is you've typically had an ongoing lease or capital program going on with technology. We may need to be looking at that and we may need to say, okay, maybe we need to, over time, I'm not saying do it all at once, but over time we may need to see whether or not that can inch upwards. Um, and, and if I were to tell you in the long run what a, a goal might be over the next five years, is right now it's around $70,000. You may want to try to see if that can inch up to around $100,000. And that's just, you know, sort of the speculation on my part of where you may want to try to grow that figure to, uh, if it's possible. So those would be the three things that I would point out, you know, from the, from the dollars uh, of, of where you're looking at, you know, budgetarily. So it's sounding like the, the FTE piece is probably the most pressing need. I had that as probably one of my deep, most pressing needs. Um, another piece that I mentioned in here, uh, probably kind of in the past it without meaning to, but uh, another piece with the devices is device insurance and maintenance. And that's another way to look at you have to have <coughs> person sitting here replacing keyboards and doing things, or you can have a device maintenance plan that it's covered. It's an insurance, like you would have, uh, like a health insurance for your devices. And it's a fairly cost-effective way to go, especially when you have 1,700 devices. We offer optional student insurance for devices when they take them home um, or have them assigned to them in school. That was new this year. About 65 families opted to purchase that insurance. So if a device is broken or, uh, or anything, it ends up being, do we pay for it to fix it and then try to chase somebody down and hope they'll pay us? So policies around that or taking that on ourselves. It's nice to get a box sent to you, you put a, a device in it, you mail it out, it comes back to you and it's working. So you just have to have a, a certain <laughs> amount of extras, which we probably have now anyways, correct? We, would, we try to build that in. As we get new students in and stuff, it makes it harder. And we've got programs now like um, the WIDA access testing. They need some dedicated Chromebooks for a period of time so that those devices are always ready and in the right place to do the access testing. Um, it, there, there are requirements now that if a student comes into district, the, that test has to happen within the two weeks that they're here. So there, there's, there's a little more demand for some of those devices. So we probably need to increase that stuff a little bit. So, so one other question before I, because I, I don't want to monopolize all your time. One of your first slides was the the one to one is four to twelve. Mm -hmm. Have we costed out what going from, and maybe it doesn't have to be in K, but one through one, two, and three, the next, the last three grades, or maybe it is four grades. The, the equipment meetings that we've had on the new Clyde Brown building have included um, one to one grades two through five, so the. The, some of the newer Chromebooks that they're getting this year will, will go over there and then they'll get some newer ones. So two through five would be one to one with Chromebooks and have some iPad carts that are available for projects because they do two different things completely. And then for the uh, lower grades, it will basically be one to two with, with iPads so that each classroom has So we may not have to go one to one in grade one. Right. Yeah. So it's not a question of funding or it just getting them up to speed and they're used differently. So really, mm -hmm. it's, it's third and second grade, correct? Is mm -hmm. that, those are the last two targeted one-to-one -one grades? Yes, and part of the reason I think that the, the well, they were getting the recycled hand-me-downs from the middle high school for a long time, and also bandwidth-wise, they didn't have the uh, infrastructure to handle yeah. being one-to-one -one over there. So we did beef up the grade four or five, uh, the grade four, three, four hallway this year because 
we knew they were getting an influx of Chromebooks and um, they do all of their MCAS testing down that hallway. So we did beef that up to cover that. So what's a grade? What's a What's the rough number uh, or the cost for a grade uh, going one to one, either Chromebook, to buy Chromebooks for a grade? Let's just use 100. Yeah, so if we were assuming 100 students, if we were getting Chromebooks, if we rounded it to 300, saying the device and then the, the Chrome uh, OS that you had to purchase to, you're looking at you know, 300 per device for 100 students. 30, 30 grand. So we're talking 60 grand, 30 grand per device. Which is down from when we first started yep. the iPads. Well, well, we were at 600 a piece almost. Well, iPads are yeah. more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I'm saying when we first implemented back in 11. Yeah, and you know when we first implemented one to one, and, and to your point of changing technology, we had a, it was part of a very lengthy discussion. But part of it was it was one to one and not an iPad initiative for this exact reason that over time, we found That's right. setting aside this $60,000 in the budget to purchase that set of devices for ninth graders coming in, and it was that $60,000, and it was $60,000 for, because we figured at some point it may not be iPad, it may be something else for the next generation, but so we built that $60,000 in the operating budget to, to account for that, but even when we did that, it was to get, in essence, grade eight through twelve, mm -hmm. and that's that was the objective was to get eight through twelve. We, we were we had a set of iPads for the eighth grade that were, but we were going to have to purchase every few years. Four years. Okay. But then we built in the sixty thousand so we could buy incoming ninth graders a set of devices every year, and, and this has grown obviously well beyond. Yeah. when we originally started and to the same extent you know FTEs were a, a difficult part of that discussion and the and rolling it out at the time and maintaining current maintaining existing staff levels so that we weren't turning around and we you know need to bring on this whole new initiative but then we needed a whole new influx of FTEs just to support it now to be at 1,700 and eight grades, that's a different discussion that, that, that we probably need to address. And, and there are other aspects to that discussion that, that you're making me think of. So the ninth grade devices in general have been funded differently over the last few years. Like, um, I think this past year we just bought the ninth grade Chromebooks. The year before I think it was a lease to a VAR, and then before that they were getting iPads. And that was through the lease warrant. Oh no, that was through the no, budget. That through so the, yeah. that's shifted a little bit. Um, the the move to Chromebooks is definitely more successful for high school. We see far more Chromebooks being used than we did when, like, for the upper grades, they're just not using the iPads like we've seen. Um, and there are a variety of reasons, I guess, for that. But moving through the Chromebooks, we're seeing the Chromebooks being used. So that's a good thing to be providing. We didn't really talk about BYOD at all. That's another whole discussion. But the upper grades, a lot of times, these students are—they want their own devices. Their stuff, it, you know, they, they, their world is on their laptop. So it's a discussion that's a possibility as well. If we were trying to cut somewhere, um, again, there'd be some policies and things we'd have to set up and network appliances or other network management that we have to do to control that piece. But that's very doable. But it would be nice to try to get those last two grades. It, it would, you know, a, a transition plan. Uh, obviously, you, you're prioritizing your your staff, which seems reasonable con considering the amount of devices and the work that needs to be done. But there's even within that, you said, do we as part do as, as a cost savings? Do we do we send things back? Do we enter into a Whatever I'm sorry with the name. Buyback, a, a buyback program for the a buyback or a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the buyback pro program will happen. It's just there's some thirty B issues that we need to. Deal I'm not talking about the buyback. I'm talking about the maintenance of it. If it's broken, you oh, put it in the office. The, the insurance. The insurance. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, some districts just lease, and they always have the newest stuff every three, four years. Yeah. They're just getting new stuff, and they don't buy it. Uh, so so we, as a committee, we have not dictated how to purchase it. 
or in what form. It was more of we made a commitment to do, like Mark said, the initial discussion. It was a three-hour deliberation, right? It was just it was a big step, and so we we don't necessarily, and I and I would um, d d defer to to at least Terry's expertise and all the different districts on what to do, and then we can have a discussion here. But we're not going to necessarily micromanage that piece. It's just more of, do we have enough money in this fund, right? And do we have enough money in this bucket to do it right? Yeah, and you may also find over time you get a natural way to get there in that, in that you know, uh, Jennifer's alluded to the fact of the BYOD issue, that particularly with seniors, They may like their own devices. If that becomes a really a prevalent attitude, you may find that you invest less, right. you know, for juniors and seniors in devices. You shift that money, and now you're investing in one to one in those lower grades. Mm -hmm. So you're not really spending any new money. You're shifting where you're spending that money. Right. And when we again at the in initiation of this whole one to one, the the, the discussion on bring your own device. Was was really in the context at the time of forcing people to bring their own device. Right. So it was how do we make this happen? And one of the options was we tell people they have to go buy a device, and then they have to bring it in. And, and the committee at the time didn't want to have to shift costs to parents and families for something we were then with that we were going to require them to do in school. We're now 10 years beyond that, and right, so maybe there's, it, again, it, my personal preference would be it's a different discussion if it's students bringing devices in because it's their preference, right. because 90% of them have them now, as long as we're providing devices for anybody who, you know, we would still have it, but instead of funding 100 for the ninth grade, well, 50 of those kids already have it. So that's fifteen thousand dollars we use somewhere else because we know how many, you know, and that again, it, it's we're well beyond where this what the attitude and atmosphere was when we started this, and there's probably different ways we can to get there. And to be honest, when you started the conversation, a laptop was probably a thousand dollars. Yeah. For that's the number. That's yeah, the number yeah, we were yeah, using. And, and now, yeah. laptop is three hundred ninety-nine right. dollars. Right. And a Chromebook is less than that. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they're. Only buying bulk is even less. Right. Right. They're two fifty, and they're probably even going down a little yeah. bit. Right. And the what? Thirty, thirty-five for the Home OS management system. And it's another. That's a mark. I was starting to think. Uh, with the Chromebooks, we pay that operating system management piece once. Uh, with the iPads, and I, and I do love the iPads, and I know that um, a couple of the grades are using them so well that it would change their world to not have them. Uh, but they have a cost every year to be managed. So, what, One other piece that you guys brought up that I think we have, we as a committee need to, and, and we have tri-board meetings coming up and, and even town-wide budget process, that it's important that we that we bring it up is this concept of what were cap what, what were capital warrant articles and they were one time link up so we've got we've got the lease ones but other things that and it's not just technology there's probably other things that are treated as capital that up until probably a few years ago it was easy I'm gonna go buy this and it's whatever you could using the example of the the Microsoft Office disk. Well, I could go buy one of those, and I'm going to have it for three or four years, and then three or four years from now, I can I need another. And that's how a, a lot of this capital, in, when it comes to technology, and even facility, was the same thing. It was, if I can buy it now, and then I don't have to worry about it for four or five years, well, nobody worried about finding it in the operating budget because it was that. Well, here's our top priorities that went to a Warren article, and we're using free cash to pay for that. So that's something we're going to have to, we as a committee need to figure out how to address. Tara, to your point of getting that lease up to 100000 it's kind of the same thing. Like, it's 
if the right number over time is going to be a hundred thousand, we got to figure out with if we get that article moved up, or are we going to have to find the twenty five thousand? Exactly. You know. It, and how do we back into it? Right. Right. Yeah, because right. part of that is how do you back into it? Because right. just saying we need to go from seventy to a hundred, it's not going to fly. It's right. what's the <clears throat> what's the thought process, and how are we incrementally why, getting? Why? Why are we doing that? Right. One of the things as we um, analyzed and Jen and I went over the device replacement schedule was um, that there was, uh, and I think the committee had requested, the replacement of server and network equipment here in this building yes. um, was, was a missing component. And I think we um, added in the capital plan a, a yearly cost of about 50000 because otherwise the network, you know, we will have a new network at Clyde Brown, but if there were about 50,000 per year for network maintenance, upgrade, uh, server dies, um, new cabling needs to go be in place for the capacity that we're, we're demanding, then that was uh, one of the missing pieces. But that's also a big chunk of money. I mean, it that's 10% mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. of our, a little less than 10%. Yeah. And, and I would also say that we need you to bear with us on a 10-year plan because right now we look at that and we say there's switches in their service. Seven um, years from now, we may right. say the same, you're spending the same money, yeah. but it is some right. cloud-based solution. Uh, sure, yeah. right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Because that's yeah. how yeah. this right. Even moving power school right. to uh, hosted service instead yeah. of hosting it ourselves right. changes a, a cost here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I think... Spending yeah. the same money, just spending it differently. Actually, mm -hmm. before I, Rob, do you have anything? Do you have anything? Any questions? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I have lots of questions for Jen about some of the stuff that they do, but it's a, not a policy or budget thing. Well, so let me just <laughs> let me let me just circle back. So, and Jen, I think you went through one process, and Terry has not, but he's heard us talk about it um, a lot. Is that every year, um, as we start the strategic or the the budgeting process? We, we, we go to the superintendent and say, we, we need a wish list, right? And, and so I think this year we're still going to do a wish list, but I think it's going to probably be constructed a little differently, meaning we're not going to be able to get through all of these cost centers before we start the budget process. But I think Terry and the superintendent is now, they're aware of how we're thinking and how we're trying to think. So your list, your wish list may still be the same, but I think it's, it's the wish list with a number and then an asterisk with some explanation and some, all right, we need to do it this year, but we should really be looking at in trying to do the warrant. So there's some work on the, on the behind the scenes that we need to work at. So the next logical step is to kind of continue the work with Terry and the superintendent and what does your budget look like next year? And, and I, I think it's fair to say that it, if it looks different, we just have to know how, why it looks different and how it's looked different. But that's what we wanted this process to be, not just an exercise and making you guys sit for two weeks and go through all the paper. And since coming on board, I've actually gone back through several years of expenditures and looked at how spending was done and just tried to take a, try to analyze whether there was a different way to look at it. So I think Terry's been invaluable in that conversation. Yeah, don't, don't feel beholden to exactly how it was done before. No. I mean, also, I probably wouldn't come in and increase your budget by 80%. Like, I think there's a, there's a, there's a buffer zone somewhere. <laughs> you can a actually, you know what, you can ask for anything you want. It's a question of what will. I've told her 75% is the top. That seems, yeah, that, that seems about right. Any other questions from Denise, anything? No, the only thing I wanted to pick up on, based on what you said, and a couple of things that you had mentioned, Jen, is as you talk about, what you go to merit for and grants for that, I would incorporate some of that into your wish list. So mm -hmm. making this room a little bit more technology savvy or identifying mm -hmm. a room. So what Steve has mentioned, the current state, the preferred state, and then the ideal state. Mm -hmm. Is an ideal state a full VR lab? What does that look like? That's um, <laughs> so so um, no one said it tonight, but usually somebody says, don't self-edit. So. Mm -hmm. As you asked really good questions about like, what do we want technology to be in the classroom? What do we want the classroom to look like? So as you're hearing from teachers about 
what's out there and what we want to bring here, I would include that as part of this process. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mark, anything else? No. Okay. Do you have any? We good? No, good, good. Super, anything? Uh, no, I'm fine. Yeah, that's just, I want to say Come once on. again what a wonderful job Jen has done. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, hopefully we can try to find some money for you. All right. That makes it even better, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, that was time and learning. Uh, superintendent's report. We've already we already did one of them. Mr. So. Wigan, you may as well stay for the no, budget we'll as, <laughs> but budget update. Okay. Uh, you have in your packets. Um, well, actually, not budget so much as um, we'll jump down first to um, a brief memo um, from Mr. Wigan on the. Uh, potential costs for installation of a portable classroom, and a second memo from Mr. Mullaney and, and Maureen Knowlton on um, the potential uses for the annex as we, as we went through that discussion and brainstormed some of the needs that are obvious to all of us beyond the six teachers on carts. Um, the space is, is desperately needed, um, and they uh, list out the needs. And um, so when fifth grade moves out, there, there is not, you know, we could, we could get most of the teachers off of carts, but then we would not have room for any of these other ideas that they've put into their memo. So uh, those two memos go hand in hand as to the rationale for why the annex is needed, some modulars are needed. Um, Mr. Wigan and Mr. Engler have been working on, on um, <coughs> comparing both moving the, the, currently, um, the current modular that we own versus uh, purchasing new. Is there anything else you want to add as you're there? Uh, no, I think you, you have the, the costs you have are basically industry costs for installation. I would say I was kind of amazed because I think last time I asked you it cost about fifty thousand dollars, and I, I honestly got I didn't manipulate these costs. <laughs> they just as I was totaling them up, I, you know. You were right on target. Without the contingency, it came to fifty thousand um, dollars. I should have gone out and bought a lottery ticket once I put this number together. Mm -hmm. I did not. Uh, but um, so so just to be clear, this is this is to move this is to move the that is for a new one. This is the new one. Now it, so again, it would probably to the move, installation. The installation. How much is the building? The building again in your last last week last time around the 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 new would be probably between and that was one configuration. There are different configurations, but the side by side classroom with a foyer. And two bathrooms was between uh, eighty-five and ninety thousand dollars. So, what is this the cost to move That's the existing? The cost to install. No, no, no. I know that. Install a new one. I get it. So total. Let me just ask. Let me ask. <laughs> let me <laughs> let me ask my question. You want to ask the move? Okay. What's the cost of the move and in installation of the building we already own? One hundred and. So, the current building we own is 115? 115. 115. And then this one is 80 to 90 plus 42. 52, sorry, 52. A lot, a lot of correcting going on. 145,000. And again, so a $30,000 delta. Conceivably, would be. It's a lot of money. That that's one configuration. So if you have a configuration, for example, that doesn't include bathrooms, which is possible, depending on where we locate this, now your plumbing expense, which is the biggest expense in that install, conceivably goes down dramatically. You're still going to have to have some water because you have to have sprinklers. You're not going to get away without sprinklers. Um, but you would not have the sewer, and the sewer should be the biggest part of the plumbing. 
so without me having to go through my files to figure my paper to get that the current, how big is the schematics that you gave us last time versus what we have now, what we own already? Is that a bigger building over there? That's a bigger building over there. That's, that's three classrooms, I think. So from a space standpoint and a cost standpoint, it would be cheaper to move what we have. Because mm -hmm. we're talking $50,000. The move, the, the setup and the setup, it do, doesn't really matter whether it's new or old. So we're talking 50 grand. So that's, that's a wash. It's a question of taking what we have or buying another one. And this one may be bigger, and we wouldn't have to put out the eighty to 90000 Correct. You would have a slight, you would have a slight expense. What do we figure? Six, six seven thousand dollars to do the floor? One to the annex we have now. Yeah, six, seven thousand dollars to repair the so, floor. So add six to seven. So put this to sixty grand. So sixty grand to move what we already own. That's not no. Wait, I thought you said one fifteen. No, hundred hundred and fifteen to move what you own now, plus another six to repair the floor. Hundred and fifteen. So that's not this number. Plus six. One twenty one. So one twenty one. For the, what we currently with the repair to the tile floors right. and we, repla total replacement. But also a bigger unit. Did we get did we get this as a, a memo the number the one fifteen or was this no, just, just got it today. Oh, okay. We so the one fifteen so, okay. All right. So so we we could not get that to you. All right, that's fine. Just to move it? Just to move it. Can you actually, can we, John, can you come up front because you're on microphone, please? So really it's 115. Just to move it. Plus six to do the floor. Plus 20. Plus 50. 50. So pro probably, yeah, plus. Depending on what you need, what? Well, that. Yes. Yeah. Maybe um, not a concrete slab. Just to move it. The, the sprinkler, the sprinkler will be a little less because you already have a sprinkler system. I okay. think installed in that, so yeah, it's just hooking it up. But the plumbing. Okay. What sewer, was the fifty? The plumbing sewer would be approximately Basically. the same. Uh, do you have bathroom? You have bathrooms in that now, yes. right? Yes. 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 Okay. So the plumbing. It, well, the plumbing will be less. See, some of that will be less uh, because the interior yeah, plumbing right already exists. Yeah. Okay. So, so the plumbing. The installation is going to be a little bit less because you're hooking up. You're not actually running some of that. I say 40. Yeah, you want to say 40? Fair. Let's just use round numbers. 40. You have to be able to cut this installation in half yeah. in, order to break, in order for it to be the same or less than finding a new one. 115 plus 6 Smaller plus 40. Can, can I, John, I'm sorry. I, none of this. My, my tone is not directed at you. 115,000. <laughs> Please explain it to me. I'm a criminal justice guy. They're going 600 yards. So you have six units. Six units need to be separated. They're on pillars. So they need to be moved over. They need to bring a crane. They need to be puffed off. They need to be put the axles back on. The tires need to be put back on. No, no, I, I understand. But how, how many days of work is this? Is it a day or two, three days? Well, they, they know that they have less than a week to do it. That's a lot of money. 115 grand. <laughs> I, I'm having a hard. So, we can't right. tell. <laughs> does it? No, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not being dramatic. Does that seem like a lot of money to you? No, yeah. yeah. I'd hate to see, see dramatic. Is, I, 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 listen, I don't live in that world, so I don't know. So, there hasn't been dialogue since we've got those numbers. He said the site for all that. All the That's fine. We'd rather have the worst case. We'd rather look at that. So the move and setup of the existing building, 115, these are rough numbers, 115 plus 6 plus 40. And so a new building, 
So we have the 52, right? That's the built-in contingency. What is the actual structure? 80 to 90, you said? Yeah, 90 would be the high. So say 90 for the structure plus 52, 5. So 53. Right. Let's just use that. So we're talking 140, 143 versus 155 plus 161. Right. A now, 20 twenty thousand dollar difference. Right. Now again, one of the things I need to, a couple of things I need to stress. Yes. Your annex is a bigger unit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you get more physical space with your annex. Yeah. That's number one. And number two, typically it is easier for a firm to come in and simply, from their yard, deliver a new unit than it is to bring their people here, pick up whatever you have, which is may or may not be theirs, and obviously then move it to whatever site you are bringing it to. Right, right, because they don't, you know, it's not theirs. They don't know what it is. So they can do that for... $70,000 less, which seems like a pretty good discount. <laughs> it's like an Ocean State job lot thing. Because they're, they're cut up, they need to sh shift it over on the pillar as well, so it's a second piece of machine as well. So you're talking to Crane. No, I, I, I know. Talking, none of that was, I, I preface by saying none of that was directed at you. Thank you. I appreciate that. It, it, it did seem <laughs> Thank you for saying I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, bigger space, but there's also the, the useful life be starting from zero versus starting from plus. So you usually go between 15 and 20 years to have them go in 12 years. I want the space, but we have to look at that. That's mm -hmm. a lot of money to outlay that. Me, and I, I would, once again, I'm a criminal justice guy. I think picking that thing up and moving it around is probably not great for it, right? They can do it. A hundred thousand. Yeah. We'll, we'll take fifteen right off the top. Exactly. <laughs> they can they can have it for a hundred grand. I'll sign the paperwork tomorrow. So, Mr. Chair, if I may, yes, what I'd like to see is the the one we priced was a two unit um, modular with a foyer and a bathroom. I'd like to see just three straight um, classrooms. No bathroom. With no bathroom, we can attach it to the building. So I know. Um, and see what the cost would be. So we get the most space for the least amount of money and without and trying to eliminate the, the plumbing that goes along in the sewer. So uh, you're saying three cuts. classrooms, no, no foyer, just literally no foyer. a door, three doors, or and then whatever ex exit well, doors. Well, something more comparable to what it is we have. Yeah. Right. Because There's I feel like we're comparing apples to oranges all three here. They're not the same thing. Um, I, I can certainly price right? that. I, and I, I will. <laughs> I think um, we may have to reach out to the building inspector just to make sure we can get away without bathrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Because it depends on where we locate. So my, personally, I would not be in favor of not having bathrooms completely attached and you didn't have to go outside. Yeah, that's the trick. Uh -huh. Or step in a portico, like literally just something's over like, your head. Yeah. Five feet. Yeah, typically, <laughs> I don't think they should have to go outside. Yeah. Well, no, typically if you have an attached right. hallway, no. basically. Not outside in the rain. Get away with it. <laughs> yeah. But I just, yeah. All right. Whether or not we have a location that we could locate something like that. Mm. But you know what, though? I think yeah, sure. checking with public health is probably yeah. the first step before yeah. we... Stop. But I, I agree with, if we're going to look at new structures, yeah. let's look at, do it the Millis way. Get the Honda Civic and not the Lexus. Which is technically a Lexus is a different car company. So not the Acura, which is within the Honda family. What? I thought we were moving away from that. Keep it the same thing. I think I want to buy the Cadillac. The Cadillac's not a Honda. No, That's a domestic car. I want to buy the I get it, but but these are big numbers. Oh no! Oh, listen. But then I I I think the needs are great. 
the this will get us through the eight years we need or whatever until this building really needs to be more addressed for for the next renovation no, no, eight to ten years no i get whatever. that but but what, uh, the, so the, what that number is coming down a little bit we, <laughs> we've got a couple years exactly. <laughs> i think that it becomes a value discussion so we have the, like, we know we have the need for the space yeah we have th this opportunity has been the catalyst for this discussion about does it make sense it's to a do long that discussion or whatever mm. so now the committee figures on new or existing or whatnot, whatever is the best value for the district. No, but, and here's my, con this is not a question of need. There is, we can stipulate and move beyond the need. And the memos, I appreciate that they did that. That This has never been a question of whether we're going to use the space and how we're going to use it. It's a question of can we afford it? And then if we can afford it, where are we going to get the money? I mean, we, I, and I hate to do this, and this is this. Jen Starr was here talking about an increase in FTE uh, on top of the other technologies, and we had we had the the special education, the meeting before, and athletics, and and I'm not saying we should be picking one over the other, but there's a lot of there's a lot of need in the there's district. There's an asset that I don't want us to. So, however we choose to use it, whether we sell it, whether we take it money for it, I just don't. I want us to be able to leverage the asset in the best way we possibly can. Mm -hmm. right. So whether that's get cash for it and, and utilize it someplace else, or get cash for it, and Mark mentioned, get cash for it and put the cash towards a new one, potentially, mm -hmm. something. Right. But exhaust all the possibilities. I don't want to rip down. I don't, I don't want to rip down, but I'm also sitting here struggling with wh what are we going to do? How are we going to find 160000 We just went to the town for $100,000 for a new phone system. I think the appetite for... Yeah, you're not alone. Well, another hundred grand plus. Off to another department for no money. So we've, we've invested. I want us to figure out the best way to I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, mm -hmm. let, me, let me suggest this to you, though. And I understand I'm, I'm talking now really not next year's budget, but the year after's budget, okay, is that if you have the additional space so that you can have your transition program, mm -hmm. just the space for that transition program would probably pay for that whole building in one year by you not having to send these kids out of district mm -hmm. for transition. Program. Do we have this? And if you don't have the exact answer right now, it's OK to say, I got to look at, are we 100% sure we have the existing current staff to handle that transition program? Because that's a cost that we'd have to add. We Getting the building is one. You, you would have, you would have a, a cost of space. Or you would have to have space. What's the FTE? Space and personnel. And you would have to, there's a. It's a 1.5. 1.5. Well, there's development costs, and then there's right. costs for the uh, teacher to program it with a paraprofessional. So but let's it use 90 and four, 25. That's 100. It could be four to five kids. Now, no, no guarantee, but four right. to five kids coming back in district. So you're talking a, you're talking a $125,000 constant cost of the teacher so let's take them out that's that's an increase and then we'd have to cover the 160 and then the 125 you're you're saying we could be the the, the first year yeah. be looking at making 280 or saving 280 would you bring those five kids back? Yeah. yes absolutely they really came in on district yeah, yeah. until yeah. age 22 so you're going to have them yeah and you're going to have them for yeah. like yeah. four years and yeah. we're going to do this with one in a para Yes, with the investment in the development of the program, and as Dr. Marks mentioned, it does take development of a superb program to have kids come back. But parents are saying to us, parents of students who are in the high school, they want a program here in Millis. They don't want their children going elsewhere right now to Easton or some other um, transition program so it, it'll take some investment but we don't have the space so we're looking also to partner with a neighboring district on this so, um, so that might help with um, mitigate some of the costs so identify what the additional costs are for the development of the program yeah we, in the we are um, so we last week and the week before and tomorrow we're finishing up our 
um, our prioritizing of preferred budget needs. Right. And I met with Dr. Marsh today. And <laughs> preferred budget needs for what? The, for FY20? For FY20. Yeah. yeah. And part of that would be the um, programming planning of the transition program for the following year. Right. We've, we've, again, we've embraced the committee's concept here, and uh, we spent a lot of time with, with all the administrators on, on these concepts. Good. And Dr. Marks and I actually were spending some time today on this very issue. That's why it happened to pop into my mind. Well, I mean, that could be yeah. it right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that could be. But then we, we're losing. If we, if we make that the keep in district for space, you've lost some of those other opportunities. Right. Because if we're going to have a dedicated space, we need to make it a dedicated space. Well, uh, they wouldn't need all three classrooms. No, they need one. They'd need one of the three okay. spaces. So. All right, so I feel like we're going to, we're punting this down the road one more time. <laughs> and why are we punting it now, Denise? What are we doing now? No, I'm, I'm not being fresh. What Do we need more yeah. information? Yeah. Well, are we, we going to figure out? The, co the other costs, the new costs. Yeah. Yeah. Different, different configuration yeah. and different whether or not we can do it without bathrooms. And, and if... Sale value, like resale value. Right. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to buy that? Who's going to buy it? Don't well, name their name, it. As well as if your competitor goes into the outdoor tent. Yeah. So we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do. Maybe, maybe trade in. I'll move it for forty five hundred dollars. I'll rent a pickup truck. <laughs> one thing at a time. It'll take me four weeks. While we have so, this is a positive thing, so I'll do it a bit more. Mr. Chair, while we have Mr. Wigan and Mr. Engler up there, we also have a capital projects update. That would be Did awesome. Did you have any questions on, on that? Um, Hold on one second. Do we have it? Do we have there is There is no memo uh, on that. Oh, we, I, um, we just need to do it orally. Yeah. Please do. Because it's yeah. been a bit of a whirlwind. Can we start with auditorium seating? Yes. Right. Oh, yes, please. Okay. We have, we have obviously completed the bid process, as you know, we've awarded a contract. Um, we have selected the seating fabric and oh, all the different <laughs> features, so the seats have been You awarded. look thrilled, John. <laughs> Do you like the fabric? <laughs> we, did not, we did not get, what was it, the spicy? Uh, Our first choice was uh, not available. Our first choice was not available. We actually have a better fabric, uh, as yes. a matter of fact. And the color, I went in because uh -oh. I made John give me a fabric swatch because <laughs> I didn't trust the computer. And I went in and I compared it to what we have now under the lights because I want to see what it looks like under the lights. It's almost identical in color. So um, it's going to be fine. So the important question is, is it comfortable? No. Oh. Yeah. That's that. That's the I don't care about that. <laughs> when, <laughs> when, that's the when will the seats be in the auditorium? They will be. All right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you can knock on wood. That's fine. But they will be demoing the seats, the existing seats, the uh, third week in March. They will install the last week in March, and so the new seats will be in April 1st. You gave yourself a good buffer. That's a good. Buffer. At least a month buffer. That's, that's a month buffer. Good job. So that's the that's the plan right now. That was what was in your agenda. April only has thirty days, remember. <laughs> you don't get so, that extra uh, day. All right, thank you. So that's the plan right now. Yeah. Excellent. How many right. seating? And how many extra how many seats are we get how many extra seats are we gonna what's the delta isn't there? Right, they won't be on the delta. Where are we putting new ones into? Four forty is four forty five. We had four But I thought there were some missing seats. Those are being, are we adding new ones, a, a Delta, those, or just those four? Those are part of 441. Yeah. We're missing all the other two. Okay. So we are going to get back to a full capacity. Okay. So, um, auditorium lighting, 
Um, we haven't gone out to bid yet, um, in part because we, and John can speak more to this, we had a, a rigging inspection today, and as I understand it, there was some code uh, oh flaws, I guess I would describe it that way, that we're going to need to address. So we're going to mm. need to figure that out, and that may, have to be, may need to be part of our bid spec when we send it out. It is going to have to be a bid because uh, it's over $50,000. Um, so John and I haven't really had a chance to talk okay. that through yet, okay, but that is something that um, we'll be talking with probably, you know, beginning of the year as far as how we're going to approach that issue. And I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. Besides the fact that we met today and it does look great on the back end. Thank you. Um, on the, I think, well, actually, you know about the phone system. What you don't know about is there's another piece of the phone system, which is the intercom system, which we have not gone out to vote yet because, frankly, we've been spending all of our time on the phones. So we're assuming we're going to sign a contract tomorrow or Thursday. Once we get the phone system off and running, we're going to go out and um, uh, get quotes on an intercom system. I thought they were all one and the same. I thought it was they a will, dual they system. They will interface Integrate, with each other. Yeah. Is there an additional cost onto the intercom system? Yeah, Meaning, there's a one-time cost. It's just a one-time And we're cost. covered on that with the, yeah, with the, the door. Warner. Okay, all right. That will come out of the Warner. Okay. It's not a big not, all right. not a problem. So it's just a one-time cost to replace, you know. And, and that is covered with exist the yeah, money it's covered with allocated. The, okay. Yeah, it will cover, be covered with the Warner. All right. So no, no worries there. Um, the um, carpet replacement, John has gotten uh, one quote of uh, 18.5. Uh, we'll need to go out and actually get three formal quotes to do the library, um, to rip, and rip up the carpet and replace it. That doesn't include moving the furniture. So again, we'll do something a little bit more formal than when we get chapter 30 and we get three formal quotes. Um, but we won't have to go out to bid because it's under $50,000. Okay. Um, the lockers, um, I'm trying to read the notes here, um, it's, uh, 5,000 to supply the solid run of 20 frames, and then 40 new double tier lockers, by 12 by 30, uh, up in the middle school area, that would be about thirty thousand dollars. We have twenty thousand dollars to spend, so we may need to look at this a little bit um, and figure out what we can do there to shave that a little bit. Or um, we also may look and see if there are additional funding sources that we could come back to you and say, "Are you willing to go?" Facilities you know, rental. Look at facilities do. rental. Yeah, yeah exactly. We haven't touched that. That, that would be my first place to look. Um, and then the furniture, Bob and Maureen and I, um, we kind of keep missing each other, but we're going to get together and figure out. I think our concept is we'd like to obviously split that $20,000 so we can do some middle school, some high school. But, uh, and we'd like to get the furniture so that it is similar. Right. Um, but it's not, really a, it's not really a mandate there to do that. Um, so if there is compelling reason that the middle school furniture should be slightly different than the high school furniture, fine. You know, I'm not dictating that, I, but I want the three of us to have a discussion about it. Sure. So that, you know, we understand the direction we're going to go because once we start in whatever direction, that's the way we're going to obviously continue to go. Um, audio. I think, did I, did I say audio? The gym, <coughs> right? Not yet. For the, for the uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, we've allocated uh, fourteen thousand dollars for that. Now I would tell you that that whole rigging issue for the lighting it also will have some effect on the audio as well. So it's some hanging speakers and that sort of thing. So again, that may have an effect on the cost there. Um, but that again is going to be a quote situ situation, and so I think our first situation is once we kind of figure out. That process with lighting, then it's relatively easy situation to do the audio phones. 
Okay. So I'm right now still not nervous about that. I obviously will get more nervous if it's you know March, but right now I'm not nervous. Yeah, because the audio would be helpful for the, t the, yeah, the no, town I meeting think, as well. Yeah, I think lighting is not as right, more than, critical. Right, exactly. More than the lighting, the, 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 the audio, audio and the seats are like really. For the, for the town meeting. And I think that. There was, no, there's, there's a sound system in the gym. Yes, that's been replaced. That's been replaced. Yeah. Think, Correct. Yeah. We, there was a donation from the. Oh, the in the gym. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I thought there was a new system. I think we needed outdoor sound system. That, yeah, yes. that's what outdoor. we need. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be off the wall installed. And yeah. All right, so we're good. Yeah. Mr. Engler, did you have something to add? You look like you had something to add. Because it's very impossible I forgot something, so that's why I was kind of. I'm going to buy Mr. Angler a cup of coffee, and we're going to sit in the new auditorium chairs on May 1st. We'll drink some That's right. That's right. <laughs> Whose rule is that? Ours. <laughs> can, can we have a bottled water? I will buy you a bottled water, and then we'll no. sit on May 1st and have a conversation. We're going to be strict. I'm back on Diet Coke tomorrow morning. Actually, I should. Shouldn't say this on camera, but one of the Please, then don't. <laughs> <If you laughs> I constantly say things, but I never say I should be because, saying it. Because, because, because our very kind state representative, who, who obviously did all of this, I am thinking that what we ought to do is save one of the chairs, put a plaque on it put for him, yes. and then give him one of the old chairs. I oh, think yeah. you, you know That's what? a great idea. I think I think Linsky would like that. Yeah. I think that he's been very he's been very kind to this school yes. district and to this town. So. Yes. He spent many hours in those terrible chairs. <laughs> I, I, think, I think he would appreciate the... Um, I don't think that's a bad idea. He may throw it out, but I don't think well, it's I, a bad I, idea. I, I, don't, I don't care what he does with it, but I just think it would have to be. I think that's it for those guys, right? I think so. I hope so. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you both. So, uh, very quickly moving on to enrollment, we have uh, basically... Um, uncovered two more choice students who have been who moved over a year ago um, and so I just once again want to tell families if you know of anybody who's moved out of district um, we allow students to stay and choice into district if you've moved out of district just let us know your new mailing address because it does help uh, bring in choice funding for us uh, basically we have gone up um, to 1,247 students um, with some additional move-ins. The, um, in your packets, you have two memos from uh, Maureen Knowlton and Joan Lynn who have been working very hard to try to answer the questions that were posed for the standards-based report card survey. They're um, working on getting a schedule of working group meetings uh, starting in January and looking forward then to um, having the working group meet and um, continue the, the excellent work and if you'd like them to come back in January. Maureen's been out um, sick with one of the um, one of the illnesses going around the schools, and but they can come back in January. So, I, I, so Nancy, thank you for pulling this together, and, and we were fine with waiting until January. Um, what I think, as the working group commences, and you talk to your admins, I think it's important to identify what is the, what is the drop dead date for implementation in eighth grade, um, because we need to have a report out and a conversation so the committee can make a decision on whether we go into eighth grade. So that's a decision that will be made by the committee and obviously we'll take it in consultation with you and the working group, but we need to identify that date and make sure that we have updates, final reports, midterm, whatever we want to call them, but we should have what we need and, and sit here collaboratively and make 
the decision on what happens in eighth grade. Any thoughts from the committee? Mark, Denise, anything? So are they on? Are we going to have an actual presentation with these memos in January? Or if you'd like, or what I would recommend is, is um, perhaps allow the working group to do, to do some, some further analysis. Um, but if you'd like Maureen and Joan to come in and, and present on this aspect, um, they're more than happy to do so. I think, I think we should have a presentation on the results from the initial survey since we sent, since we sent the survey out to a portion of the community. That was based on the fact that we had a subset of members of the community formally ask the school committee to look at standards-based grading as a process. We then had multiple hundreds of people, when you count in the students, fill out the survey. Mm -hmm. Let's address the survey, the results of the survey, what we're going to do to, and what the plans are for, for moving forward on the survey. And yeah, I think there's a discussion to be had as to whether or not we should be focusing on improving in the areas that we probably need to improve on in the existing set of grades that we're doing this in, especially primarily the middle school, versus continuing the expansion of it as was the plan. I think that there are some pretty consistent feedback from the <coughs> parent survey that was somewhat mirrored, although percentage is not as low in the student survey. The example I, I saw just in here is, you know, when the students, you know, and the students, if I need more time to learn something, to get extra help, in the fifth grade, that was only 49%. Sixth grade, it was only 63%. Most of the other questions from the students were in the 80 to 90 percent range, favorable, agree with, etc. And you know, one of the things about the whole standard based philosophy, and one of the things that, that came out in the parent survey as well, is there's questions as to whether or not we're, we're providing the additional support that we're supposed to be providing the feedback that we are if students aren't at a three. So there's concerns of are we are we implementing it and doing it well enough that we should just continue the, the progression all the way through. And I think that's a fairly substantial conversation and important conversation that we should have. And, and you know, I, I read, I did read through the memo that we got this afternoon, and I, I guess I'll just take, there was a couple of comments in it that I disagreed with. One on the, it's on the fourth page when it's in the feedback. I don't think the working group will make a decision about eighth grade grading for next year. Where is this, Mark? It's on the fourth page of the memo. The memo I have only has three pages. Not the one we got today. No. Well, Which I one? printed on four um, pages. Uh, it's under teacher feedback, second discussion points. Number eight. Did you get the latest memo? It's above eight. Okay. Did it change? Oh. Eight. Oh, yeah. Here. Is this what? So 
So it says one of the things in teacher feedback, using standards-based grading for high school placement recommendation. The working group will make decisions okay, about eighth yeah, grade yeah. grading. Well, I don't. And maybe I that's maybe the context is, is different, but I think there are various options of, of how to move forward. Of course, um, you know the uh, a hybrid um, or you know um, keep um, you know there's a range. There's a um, yeah, and I think a full range of options of what to do in grade eight. Um, and since there will be parents and teachers together with a couple, uh, with Joan and Maureen on the working group, I think that that'll be a fulsome discussion of what are the elements we might want to keep, what are there elements we don't want to keep, what, what will it look like. So I, I think it's not a black or white decision, keep it the same or move to the model we currently have. There's a full range of options. And I think one of the things, um, Sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I think one of the things that we, we might want to consider, to Mark's point, is do we undertake all of that discussion related to eighth grade, or in the short term, do we focus on addressing some of the concerns raised in feedback from the surveys and taking a little bit of a retrospective on the implementation in fifth, sixth, and seventh, identify what we, um, what people have called out as being some things that they would like um, more, either more information on or differently or just where they rated it, let's say less than 50 percent. So before expanding the scope of the project, do we want to, um, you know, address some of the things from the initial rollout that, that could be improved so that as we do expand, that we're kind of, the, the foundation of it, um, we've kind of gone back and made some made some improvements and taken a little bit of a retrospective mm -hmm. on it before and we expand I, I can it. say already starting at spring of last year, the revisions and the improvement process and based on the feedback are um, already, you know, based on our summer meeting, but also they had an end of year meeting last year. And then based on the survey results, uh, all kinds of um, ideas for improving already are in process. So I think it'll be um, a good, you know, a very good dialogue. I think it'll be, um, I, I want to assure everybody that we are entering into it with um, open minds about how to improve, how to make this the best possible, um, you know, it is it is um, groundbreaking work in many ways, and how to make it work for students, parents, and teachers alike. So it's there's there's a lot to it, and I think it uh, you know the working group we have in place will be really uh, be able to delve deeply and respectfully into all the things that that will make it just stronger, and what it looks like in grade eight is so um, completely up in the air that we're, we're very open to that. Um, teachers have started already, as the high school has, um, done a, some work this past release day. I included it in your um, packet for what uh, occurred on the last release day. Um, they're working on developing the proficiency scales and defining what does proficient look like, what does exceeding proficient look like? What are unpacking the standards? First of all, identifying what the power standards are that have endurance and leverage and provide readiness for the next grade level. And then unpacking them because within one standard, there are many, many sub skills. So all of that work, um, there's a lot to standards-based assessment that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the standards-based report card. So all of that good work yeah. is, is um, ongoing. Um, one other thing, just yes. as I follow on to Mark's um, comments, I think that for all of the people that participated in the survey and for the folks that um, signed the petition, 
for having the presentation in January. Yes, I think for us to make make a public with enough advance notice for folks saying that we're going to have a presentation at school committee on what the responses were and kind of what action steps are coming out of that would be an, an important way to close the loop with all of the respondents and also with just the community in general. So I, I would say teachers, families, I concur. Um, and students. Yep. Mm -hmm. I concur. Rob? Um, yeah, I don't have any questions about it right now. Okay. Mark, you good? Yeah, can I, I just want to think. In this, in this memo, again, that we got today, in the, there's a question about enhanced implementation process and plan for high school transition to middle school. The last sentence of this says the working group will discuss how best, how to best implement the recently revised school committee's middle school promotion and retention policy. I don't understand that. Okay. The policy is what the policy is. I'm not sure there's implementation to be done, but I could be wrong. Okay. It's on this page, page yeah. two. Okay, you see it? I'll ask for clarification there. Denise, you good? Yes. Mark, you're good? Mm -hmm. Robin's good? Mm -hmm. I'm good for now. Um, so yeah, let's figure out um, what meeting in January to oh, do. Sorry. Yes. And we can bring, because Steve mentioned it at the beginning of the year. I think it's important when we meet in July, in January, that we come up with a drop dead date of what decisions need to be made and when for next year. I know in the I know currently the plan is for the working group to meet at least monthly. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned that monthly meetings between now and June, June. isn't going to get us where we need to get to. Mm -hmm. So I think we just really need to have an idea of what decisions need to be made, when they need to be made, and back into what work needs to get done between now and then. Excellent. All right. Um, moving on to my report. Um, nothing new under strategic planning. We did another strategic, Bless you. strategic planning budgeting um, discussion, another helpful one. Um, I will work with the superintendent to determine what's next for us. Um, at some point, we really, because it's going to have budget implications, we need to do early education. We need to look at pre-K and K. Um, that really depends on where Terry is with that, because a lot of that is financial piece. There is a there. There were questions, but there's a there's a big financial piece to that that we struggled with last year um, in the spring. So we need to take a fresh. We can't be doing it mid-budget cycle like we did last time. So. And Mr. Chair, yes. if I may, we're building um, at the end of December into the beginning of January, building the budget. Mr. Wigan will be building the budget for next year. Um, and as he's mentioned, there's uh, shifting of accounts that needs to happen, um, some redefinition of mm -hmm. some things, the cleaning up of how we how we categorize things, et cetera. So if we could not have um, a presentation on January 8th that requires a heavy lift from him because he'll, he'll be doing that work during the Christmas break and into yeah. the beginning of January. And I agree that then maybe the next thing we um, look at um, maybe for the beginning of February is early childhood. Transportation we could do in there because it's pretty, pretty easy and, and straightforward. Um, but I think then, why don't you we say do the complex one? Why don't we do tra childhood. transportation? Is not going to be that bad. Although right. the total operating cost sheet has to be updated as as it does for athletics. Why don't we do transportation at the second meeting in January, and do pre K K. In the first in meeting of February. Okay. And then obviously we can we can relook at it as we progress. Um, and then so the budget process um, it has begun. Um, 
it begins every time, or there's a part of it every time someone presents in front of us, and we go through the current, preferred, and ideal state. Um, several of you, or all of you, saw the multiple emails, um, just kind of stream of consciousness that I sent to Terry, Mr. Wigan, about kind of as we prepare for the process from the cost of the new school to the cost of a conversion of our financial systems to I lost track of it. There was a lot of email traffic today, mm -hmm. but just basically, and none of them were in preparation for tonight. It was as we progress, um, and I suspect in, in one of the emails, Mr. Wigan said that they were already looking at that, and I my reply was that does not surprise me. So I think a lot of what, it's more of a documentation for the committee of kind of where we, what we want to look at, um, not setting the priorities, but there is going to be a point where we are getting close to. But we're, I think we're ahead of the game. I think we're ahead of the game on negotiations. I think we're ahead of the game at looking at the budget. So I think that's some good progress, and there's still a lot of work to be done, but um, there's some good collaborative work being done around budgeting. And then lastly, the tri-board. Um, the first meeting of the tri-board is in January, January 8th? No, 9th. When, Wednesday when the 9th. Yeah. <laughs> the 9th. Um, January 9th, um, that is a meeting of the school committee, the board of selectmen, the finance committee. Um, the new capital planning committee will be invited. They're not, it's still a tri board meeting, but they're, they're going to be invited. Um, the town administrators invited. Um, the new finance director for the town, as well as the superintendent and the business manager. So uh, there's a good meeting. And one issue that has been kind of hanging out there um, that could be brought up at the tri board because it kind of crosses all lines um, is field maintenance. And um, as I was writing my email request to Mr. Wigan and the superintendent, I believe he was at a meeting with Mr. McKay around field maintenance. So. Uh, that's not the end of the discussion, but that's a, uh, it, it, there, there's going to be some crossover on some of these issues. The, so the first tri board will be mostly, let's just sit back across the table from each other. Uh, the board of selectmen will be hosting the first, um, and either the finance committee or we, I will be hosting the second. So we're going to rotate. We're going to do at least three, um, and if we need to do more ahead of budget time, we will. So. More to follow on that. They're going to set an agenda. As soon as I get the agenda, I'll send it. So that is it for um, the chairman's report, subcommittee report, elementary school building committee. Nancy, you attended tonight. Anything to report other than the phone? Um, any updates? The phone, we're uh, working on the time capsule. Yeah. Um, Technology, a lot of technology work right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just okay. It, it, internally, the administrative team has a transition planning document that we um, use to and subcommittees, um, and it's on every admin team agenda for every other week that we. Are, uh, have to consider the programmatic um, implications, especially around things like unified arts and how to have um, uh, band um, over in the in the elementary. Um, so the that those curriculum pro programmatic staffing issues, all of the then logistics of inventories, identifying all the equipment that stays and goes and some equipment that might come to middle high school. Um, all of that is, is um, happening internally. So there's a lot of balls and everybody's frantically juggling to try to keep them all in the air. <laughs> Excellent. All right, correspondence. Um, I included a, the Millis Medway News, uh, ran a couple of nice articles on our Millis girls soccer state champions for uh, uh, their second year in a row. And that was a wonderful article. Millis celebrates veterans and this is a, a great project. Um, we, we do things internally with um, 
Dave Fallon in the U.S. history class with the veterans and the capturing their stories. Uh, Janice Norton and the band uh, played at the celebration on Veterans Day. And um, so there's a nice, some nice pictures there. And then our John and Abigail Adams scholarship winners, both um, at Millis High School and in Medway, are featured and listed. So we always appreciate Millis Medway news. They do a good job. The, uh, there's also a memo in your packets about a wonderful program, interdisciplinary program that is happening at the eighth grade for the middle school. And you have a, a letter from Tricia White, one of our teachers in the eighth grade. And it's a global citizen project. So they're reaching out across the globe to try to get as many people from all around the world to answer 11 questions and send them in to Millis students and also ideally to send back a little video of their answers, but it could just be in writing. And we um, are hoping that you might, if you know people across the globe, be willing to send these questions to them oh. and ask them to answer. Sure and do. they will, um, are creating an interactive map with links to each person answering the interview questions as a way to, we always talk about uh, Millis being a wonderful little town, but because it is a wonderful little town, we need to bring the world to Millis and also send our kids out to the world. And I think we do a good job. And this is one example of another way we're doing so. And then finally, I, there's a hold the date for Friday, February 8th. The school committee is invited to come to the <coughs> legislative breakfast that um, Tech is putting on our Tech Collaborative. It will be in Natick this year, and it's a good opportunity for us to dialogue, to present our challenges, and also to thank our representatives for their support, but let them know what the reality is in our uh, districts, especially around the Foundation Budget Commission recommendations. So that will be the focus of that. Forum. So there was a there was a discussion at the tech meeting that you were not there about this breakfast mm -hmm. and what they should what they should be doing, um, and there was we need more money, and so I <laughs> we were going around the table and I shared that in our in our district we were looking our small little district we were looking at current preferred and ideal because it's easy to say we want more money but what does that mean? What exact, what's the actual delta you need and what is it for? And so I think there's gonna be another tech meeting. Denise is very familiar with tech and the workings of tech um, as well as Nancy, but I think there's gonna be some discussion. So some of what we're talking about um, in addition to thanking our legislators for their constant support is to, to put a dollar figure to what, what does it look like in Millis, right? This, the total operating cost is $17 million. This is what we get for the operating budget. This is the revolving accounts. This is the grants. And this is what it costs. And this is what we should be getting, right? Mm -hmm. Above and beyond the revolving, we need to do it right. I'm just throwing mm -hmm. a figure, completely figure. We need an extra 300 grand a year, right? Or 400, whatever it is. And that's not shooting for the sky. That's literally just to do it right and to, to, to have the FTEs, to go from 2.8 FTE in technology yeah. to Fox, right? And to do this and to do that and to staff an inclusion program. So I, I, I think what we're doing here, I think can also help mm -hmm. us as we approach our legislators mm -hmm. and we make a case for, it's easy to say we need more money, but what are you gonna actually, what, what are you gonna actually do? Mm -hmm. And of course, we would spend whatever they give us, but mm -hmm. to give them something so they can work with their colleagues. So that's right. just, that was a, I think mm -hmm. there was a second, I think there was a superintendent's meeting. Yes. And so that's, that was part of the discussion at the, the, the board meeting either mm -hmm. last week or the week before, two weeks ago. Yeah. The nice thing is we're going to be compiling all that, um, you know, 
it's one thing for us to say Millis, you know, when 13 other communities right. no, no, no. chime yeah, in um, and say, but if we're all approaching it from the same thing. idea, yeah, yeah. right, the, the, right, you know, here are all the districts, and this is what the total asked for for all of these districts, and here's the breakdown by each one. Yeah. So, anyways, all right. So, so one final Go announcement, ahead. if I may. I'm sorry to that. We'd like to welcome James Wall, our part-time custodian who replaced a custodian who resigned a couple months ago. Um, the process took a little while, but we are thrilled with his hire. We had great applicants. And uh, so James started last week. Excellent. Welcome yes. aboard. <laughs> and then lastly, um, any old business or new business? No. Nope. Um, I think you were either coming in or just settling in. Mr. Mullaney does not have to come back okay. for those. Yeah, great. He I can brief you and you can, uh, if he wants to come back, he's more than welcome, but it's <laughs> not necessary. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, we did have executive session. We, we, we did not have a meeting on Monday. Let's, we can hold off. Let's do pre-meetings prior to each mm. unit A and unit B. Excellent. We should book a half hour before. Mm -hmm. um, we can look at some of the financials because I think Terry is still running some of the financials for both of the unit A and unit B. So, I, Mr. Chair, we yes. did load today um, all of the spreadsheets he has developed so far into the folder that for this executive session. So the... Okay. Interactive spreadsheets are in there for the committee's use. And so what we can do over the next couple of weeks is we run some scenarios, and then ahead of the next meetings, we we can go back. Okay. So I, I'm unless anyone really wants to go sit. I'm okay. <laughs> Mark, is, is that a yes? I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. Okay. Robin, okay. I know you like to get in there and talk. <laughs> All right. So that being said. Mr. Chair. Yes. I make a motion. Second. Motion has been made and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Happy holidays. Happy See year. you in the new year. Oh, that's right.